There are six teams on the current MotoGP grid that were also on the MotoGP grid in 2003, 20 years earlier. And I have run polls, as I like to do, asking you guys who you thought was better between the rider lineups of the 2003 versions of these teams or the 2023 versions of these teams. And I have the results right here. Now we're in a new setting today. As you can see, I'm not in the usual spot. I am visiting Australia for once on a parent's house filming this one. Not stuck in the icy cold UK winter for now. And this is our first video of 2024. And it is one that we should have filmed in 2023. And I in fact did try to film it in 2023 and had an issue with the video and all that stuff. And I've put it off till now. And that's why we're comparing 2003 and 2023 and not 2004. 2024. Interesting nonetheless, because it's left us with some cracking lineup comparisons here. And the first one we're talking about, the first one you voted on was the 2003 Aprilia versus the 2023 Aprilia lineups. Now, of course, the 2023 lineups, we know very well, it's Alicia Spargaro and Maverick Vinales, and we kind of know what we're getting with them. But if we look back now, back through the back catalogue of our MotoGP memories, you'll find a couple of cult heroes, I'd say, heading the charge for Aprilia back then. And they, of course, were the Texas Tornado himself, Colin Edwards, and Nitro Nori, the journeyman Nitro Nori Haga. So if we look at the results here, you voted heavily in favour of the 2023 lineup. Alicia and Mav taking this one with 89% of the vote. So not a lot of love there for the Nitro Tornado. You know, are we understating the qualities of Edwards and Hager here? Very much a World Superbike versus MotoGP battle this one, and what do you value when you make your vote? So when we look at Edwards, you've got a two-time World Superbike champion here without a MotoGP win, despite his long career in MotoGP, but was always, always, always reliable and had a place in a team. Like contract season would come up, you know, guys would be sorting out their lineups and, you know, Colin Edwards would find himself on a factory Yamaha or something. Like it just, he, they, they knew what they were getting and they always had a place for him. And I think that's valuable just because of his reliability. He was quick, he was always quick and he always kept his teammate honest. He never really got blown away. And he had teammates like Valentino Rossi we're talking about here. And whilst obviously he was never quite at that level, he was never getting left at the back of the grid. The Yamaha was in decent nick that year. Colin Edwards is in decent nick that year. With Nitro Nori, we've got a guy who actually never won the World Superbike Championship, despite being close to doing it on several occasions. He, he's finished second in the World Superbike Championship three times. I guess with Haga, one of the things you got to look at is he only spent two full seasons in MotoGP, this being one of them, the other one being in 2001. There was a gap in between there. But a real legend of World Superbikes and, and picked up 43 wins, his fifth all-time in the rankings of World Superbike winners. So... And with the latest, you've got, you know, you're looking at three three wins in MotoGP. Never really did anything outside of MotoGP. And then with Mav, he's got a Moto3 World Championship. So I guess you could rate, rate that quite highly. And you've got nine MotoGP wins there. So look, it has gone in favor of Alash and Mav. Did I think it was going to be closer than what it's ended up? Possibly. But I do get it because you've got not a single MotoGP win across the other two. And you've got uh, 12 MotoGP wins across Alash and Mav there. So Maybe that does make sense. It's 1-0 to 2023. Let's move on now. We'll stick with the factory teams and let's move on to Yamaha now. The Yamaha factory team, and now we're in a bit of a slump here, Yamaha, at this point, but they, were, they had two good riders on board. 2003 team of Marco Melandri and Carlos Checa. The 2023 team, of course, being Fabio Quattararo and Frankie Morbidelli. Now, this one has once again gone in the favour of the 2023 lineup, And you could probably see why that's the case. I'd probably agree. Fabio Quattararo probably being comfortably a top three rider in MotoGP on, on ability alone, despite the fact the results haven't quite been there for him in the 2023 season uh, due to the bike not being in a good place. So I can say it's probably you've got a MotoGP world champion there, right? So understandable this one has gone to the 2023 team. but And you know I don't have to read out the stats and stuff for you for Frankie Morbidelli and Fabio Quattro, you know it's recent enough. You've got race winners and world champions there and guys who are able to run at the front of MotoGP quite comfortably. So Frankie had a bit of a stagnation there, but we're hoping the best is still yet to come for him. But with Marco Melandri, I think we had one of the absolute best talents I think we've had in a long time. And how this guy has not ended up winning a world championship in MotoGP, I mean, he did come at the wrong time. And I think that's the thing for him. I think he's as good. Maybe as like your Morbidellis, your Mears, some guys like me who have won world championships, stuff like that. But he just was probably a touch too early. Imagine him 
as the Banyaya. But let's look at what it was like. Melandri, first of all, gave us one of the greatest moments of all time in MotoGP. Melandri was a real natural on a bike. 250cc world champion, went up to challenge the big boys. He came up into a field that had like Valentino Rossi in it, Max Biaggi's and things like that. And he came straight in and he was quick straight away to the point where 2005 came second in the world championship on a satellite team and picked up five MotoGP wins. He had 22 Grand Prix wins across all three classes. It was probably, he had a Frankie Morbidelli moment actually. His 2008 move to the Ducati factory team to teammate with Casey Stoner, which we all thought was going to work, did not work at all. It's probably killed him off. He ended up going to World Superbikes where he didn't even win the World Superbike Championship, unfortunately, but finished in the top three a couple of times. Now with Carlos Checa, he had another one of these guys that came in as a young guy and was a real eye catcher. So came into the 500cc class, and I want to say like the mid 90s, you know, it was a long career for Carlos Checa. And he was quick early on in the 500 days, really took to the two strokes, won two races in 500s, consistent podium getter until that sort of switched to four stroke in 02. And while he still had a good career after the introduction of the four strokes, it never really quite got to that level again, never won another race but it was a consistent top 10 finisher all the time. And he's actually, his 2005 season for Ducati when he replaced Troy Bayless was actually quite good. He picked up a couple of podiums there uh, and then ended up making the switch to World Superbike and being a world champion there. But yeah, I mean, I probably have the same as you. You've got to give it to, to uh, the 23 team because Fabio Quattararo is world championship and the fact that he probably should almost by now be a multiple world champion, I think tips it in their favor but i think frankie morbidelli and melandry are a really good comparison i think that's a that's a very even match up that one as we move on now we'll get into our first satellite team and it is of course now gas gas ktm but formerly gawa yamaha tech Twa. and this one we finally got one on the board for the 2003 lads. 79% of the vote to the 2003 Tech Trois squad of Alex Barros and Olivier Jacques, who've beaten out, of course, Paul Spargo and Augusto Fernandez. And this, I 100% agree with this one. Alex Barros has to be one of my favorite riders of all time. I'm telling you, the streets will not forget this guy. He had it all. Alex Barros had everything in his locker. Now, let me take you back here to the, the season before the one we're talking about in 2003, the 2002 season when we saw the four strokes come in, but we still had 500s on the grid and we still had two stroke 500s on the grid. Did we still have that in 2003? I don't think we did, but we did in 2002. And Alex Barros at the time, was partnering up with Loris Caparossi on the Honda Pons team. Honda Pons with the West Lee, as one of the best looking bikes of all time, the black bike with the, the white, and it was like the equivalent of the McLaren in the like 98, 99 McLaren, you know, with the West sponsorship. And so they'd get the name on the side when you couldn't show the West logo because of the cigarette advertising laws. And in that season, Alex Barros on the two stroke 500 was consistently mixing up with the front guys, leading races, all that sort of stuff. But that's not the impressive bit. Here's the bit that gets me because for the last four races of the season, Honda gave Pons some four strokes to work with. And Alex Barros got himself on one of these four strokes. And in the last four races of the season, went first, third, second, first. Now, you can't tell me if they didn't give this guy that bike at the start of the season. He's not challenging Valentino Rossi that year. That is remarkable. He's finished fourth in the World Championship, most of it on a two-stroke. I mean, he was just, it was something else, Alex Barros. I always really loved Alex Barros. And so over the course of his career, 500 and MotoGP, he won seven races, which sounds less than I thought it was going to be, to be honest. But his career started, his first full 250cc uh, season in the 80s and rose his last full season in MotoGP in 2007. So we're talking almost 20 year career. He did come back for a couple of races, just showed his face a couple of times after that. And so I'm not surprised with Alex Barros in this one that he's been, they've been voted as the winning team on this occasion. Olivier Jacques himself, a 250cc world champion, the iconic 250, that season where he was teammates with Shinya Nakano. Unfortunately for Jacques, he never really got going in MotoGP. He didn't last too long there. I think he's, I've got his best full season finish. His team. So not too bad. And now here's where it gets interesting because you've only got one world championship on that team, yet it's won comfortably, but you've got two world champions in this team in Paul Espargaro and Augusto Fernandez. Now I agree on ability. I think the other two probably take the cake. I mean, very good case for these two. The 21% of you that voted for Espargaro and Augusto Fernandez, you can make a good case here because with Paul Espargaro, you've got a two, uh, Moto2 two world champion. Got 15 Grand Prix wins across all classes. Before his move to Repsol Honda, we know how good he was and how promising it was looking for him. And that move to Repsol was really the one we thought maybe could have made him, but didn't quite. We know now that bike wasn't really fit for purpose uh, for him to, to do anything on. And 
it's kind of killed him off a bit. And with Augusto Fernandez, I mean, is he as big a talent as his world championship win could suggest? We're still learning that, I think. And his time at MotoGP so far has been decent, almost good, if not unspectacular. So he's got something to build on there. But I agree. I, I'm, I'm giving it to Barros and Jack. if anything, just because Alex Barros is one of my favorite riders of all time. I absolutely loved him. And I think he definitely was underrated. And I think that 2002 season really could have been something for him. Instead, it ended up being like one of the most dominant seasons of MotoGP of all time for Valentino Rossi. And you can watch a video about that right here. And but wait to the end. No, don't get to the end. Bye. We'll go to another satellite team now. We've got... The Grassini team. Look, I'll tell you now, 2003 has won this as well. So it's two all. It's two all. 2003 has won with 70% of the vote. Now, I guess the bit that surprises me here is that it didn't get more. Uh, with some of the other blowouts we've seen, to pick up 70% here when, you know, the Aprilia ones ended up at 89% win, you know. The winner's gone to 2003. It was, of course, Sete Gibbonau and Daijiro Kato. And so when we look at the 2023 lineup, Digi and... Alex Marquez. I'm not really sure where these 20, 30 percent come from, to be honest. But Alex Marquez, you've got world champion there. I get it. Twice world champion, Moto three and Moto two. So maybe I'm underrating him a little bit. But I also, since he's got some MotoGP, whilst he's had a decent season again this season in the in the previous season, hasn't impressed me all that much. And Digi, I mean, he's got four Grand Prix wins in all classes, one in MotoGP. Although this vote was taken before Digi picked up that win in MotoGP. So people are just, maybe they're seeing a bright future for Digi there. But I'm telling you, Sete Gibbonau being the only guy that was really taking it to Valentino Rossi in what were probably his most dominant years. I think he's probably underrated. Uh, he picked up nine Grand Prix wins, Sete Gibbonau. And his career after those challenges with Valentino, he peaked late in his career. Seto. His career ended in MotoGP not too long after these 2003-2004 these season where he finished second to Valentino. He, he, he didn't go on too many years after that, only a couple more seasons. So he did peak late in his career. Bit of an elation, I'd say. But I definitely think he is a class above, I'd say. I'd take him over Alex Marquez and Digi. And then with Daijiro Kato, obviously we never, sadly never really got to see what could have been there. All the promise was there that he could have been the next big thing. And I'd probably have him as, on talent, the best of these four riders, to be honest. And to back that up, I'll just give you a little bit of what makes that the case for me. First of all, somehow this guy did like three wild cards in a row or something in Japan and won two of them and podium the other. And, you know, you'd have thought after these days, after you get one podium as a wild card or, or a win as a wild card, you will trade it like... Some team's taking you on. It took him a long time to get into the Grand Prix paddock in 250s. But then once he did get into 250s, he had two full seasons in 250s. And he came third in one and won the championship in the other. And then unfortunately, it was his move up to MotoGP uh, and, and the crash. I believe it was the first round as well in 2003 at Suzuka where uh, the crash claimed his life. So, yeah, this is the 20th. 2003 lineup. The actual lineup ended up uh, another rider, Ryuichi Kianari, came in and replaced Kato for the entirety of the rest of the season. So, but I, this is the lineup they went into the season with Sete Juvenal, Dajiro Kato. And that's the one I've put on here for the vote. And they've won and they should have won. Uh, but Dajiro Kato, two, 17 wins he picked up in his career, like off 53 starts. It's not bad. <laughs> it's not bad. Tell you what, he was a freak, Kato. He was a freak. And he, he would have been massive. I'm telling you that now. So it's two all. 2003 and 2023. We're two all with two still to play. We're up to number five. Fight. And the number five lineup matchup is, of course, the Ducati factory team. We've got two factory teams left to go. Big win here for the 2023 lineup. 87% of the vote go to Pecco Bagnaia and Anaya Bastianini. Now, this is one where I almost could contest the 2003 lineup may have actually been a little bit better. Uh, the stats probably don't back it up, although they might, but I'm going to read them to you because it was Troy Bayliss and Loris Caparossi. Uh, Troy Bayliss, very close to my heart as Australian. He was the first, I mean, after doing, it was like, where's the next one going to come from? And then Troy popped up in World Superbikes and was doing the business. And when he got across to MotoGP with Ducati to launch that project, it was very exciting. It was very exciting. And he's come, he came across as a World Superbike champion. I think it was just a one-time Superbike World Champion at the time. And he went back to win two more. So he's a three-time World Superbike champion. So how highly do you rate World Superbike titles when you vote, right? Because at the time of doing this, Pecco is a one-time world champion. So is one world championship in MotoGP worth more than three World Superbike championships? That's up to you to decide. I'm not sure it is. Maybe it is. It is the pinnacle of the sport. Possibly it is. But let's talk about Troy. Three-time World Superbike champion. Obviously, 
we remember the great wildcard performance and we're talking about Kato and Bayless with wildcards here. I've got a video for that too. Watch it at the end. I'll link it up here as well. Won a race in MotoGP uh, as a wildcard in 2006. After coming back just to jump on it for Ducati there. It was one of the greatest races of all time. Go watch it. Uh, but his first year in MotoGP with Ducati was good. Picked up three podiums, finished sixth, struggled thereafter and then his switch to Honda didn't quite work out for him and he ended up back in World Superbikes where as I mentioned he went on to win the world title again. Loris Caparossi, the phenom himself. Now we're talking about Pedro Acostas and things like that being like, oh my God. Loris did it first, right? Loris Caparossi was the Pedro Acosta of the 90s. Okay, you've got to understand this. And and by the way, I'll put a picture up. The, that, that one two, the bike he had in 125s when he won the championship on debut that Polini sponsored. The, oh my God, it's a thing of beauty. But it was a strange career for Loris. It, it kind of, he did this weird thing, right? Where you'd never ever see this again, I don't think. Won the World Championship, one two fives. Did he win two in a row? I think he might have won two in a row. He went up to 250s, didn't win the World Championship there, finished in the top three a couple of times, went into the 500cc class. You think, that's it, he's going now. He's into the 500s. He's not going back to the intermediate class now to win that World Championship. And then after spending a bit of time in, 500, in, the, in the Premier class in the 500s, went back to 250s, won the World Championship there, then came back up in to the 500s. Picked up a few podiums there in 500s. Now we're talking about a really, really long career. I think his best world championship finish was third on one of those West Honda Ponds that we mentioned earlier for Alex Barros. Finished third in the world championship on one of those. Then spearheaded this Ducati project with Troy Bayless when he went there and, and had a really good career but never really hit the heights that you'd expect. So if you think about it now, it's like Pedro Acosta going up to MotoGP now and never really doing the business. I mean, still doing winning races and things like that, but never finishing higher than third in the World Championship. You'd almost struggle to comprehend that, but that's what happened to Loris Caparossi, and it's a strange one. Never, and, and you know what? Again, probably a victim of, the, of Valentino Rossi. He picked up nine wins in MotoGP. He picked up 29 wins across all three classes in Grand Prix racing. Truly a legend of the game. Now, this is where I'm struggling to see how the 2023 team was so dominant. Now, while you've got now a two-time world champion, but was a one-time world champion when we ran these polls in Peko Banyaya, in MotoGP, that is. He has a Moto2 world championship, of course. And across his 86 starts, this is to now at the end of this season, 86 starts, 18 wins, and 28 wins in all Grand Prix. Bastianini a Moto2 world champion with five wins in Moto2, three wins in Moto2 and three wins in Moto3. And his best finish in the world championship in MotoGP is third. I think I'm giving this to 2003. Yeah, I think I, I mean, Caparossi, three world titles, Trevales, three world titles, Pecco, three world titles on his own. I get it, maybe one at the time of the poll. I keep mentioning that. When you voted for this, he was only one time MotoGP World Champ. So two world titles. Two world titles for best year. I mean, Moto2 world titles, what are they worth to you? They're worth more than a Moto a World Superbike World Championship? No, I've, they're not for me. They might be for you. It's Grand Prix racing, I suppose. I mean, now with Peko winning another World Championship, I probably would edge it maybe to, to 2023, but it's hard to say. What's a World Superbike Championship worth to you? And of course, our last team left to talk about is the Repsol Honda team. Uh, 2003, winning the vote with 65% to 35%. Again, could it have been closer? I mean, Rossi's really popular. Rossi's really popular. I'm giving it to 2003, by the way. Rossi and Hayden versus Mark Marquez and Juan Mir. I don't need to rattle off these stats, do I? Because, I mean, it's just whether or not you prefer Rossi to Mark, isn't it? And if it, and if you're split on them, it's like, do you prefer Hayden to Mir? And I think in both cases, I would prefer Hayden to Mir and I prefer Rossi to Mark uh, if I'm voting for who I think is the stronger riders, the stronger lineup. Toss a coin, really. It's up to personal preference, this one, but it's been won by 2003. They're the winners. Valentino Rossi and Nicky Hayden, with all their um, success, has beaten out the success of Mir and Mark. That's very comparable across the two here. Very comparable. comparable. I mean, there's not a lot in it between Nicky and, and Mir. There's not a lot in it between Rossi and Mark. So I've got, sorry, I'm looking down here. I've, I've got my notes. That's why I'm looking. I've been looking down here on the whole time. Uh, I've got one rider stats on one side and the other team on the other side. But yeah, 2003, which means 2003, it's a draw between 2003 and 2023. Three wins apiece across the six teams. So what we really know is these teams, some of them have improved their lineups in 20 years and some of them have not. And that is all. Thank you very much for watching. See you on the next one.